Uh, so kia ora, Aaron, thank you for spending some time today uh, with us for the uh, National Digital Forum AGM. I think it's 10 years since you last spoke with uh, the National Digital Forum. Sorry it's taken us so long to get back in touch. Um, but we're, we're really excited to just have a, a little bit of a conversation, reflecting back on your talk in 2012 and sort of thinking ahead uh, to what the future, the future may hold. I think when you last spoke with us, um, you were uh, head of engineering, digital and emerging uh, technology. I think that's uh, got that job. Yes, right. at Cooper Hewitt. Uh, at the Cooper Hewitt. And now I think with an even more fantastic job title, uh, head of <laughs> head of internet typing at the uh, San Francisco um, International Airport Museum. Um, but I wonder just for those, those people who haven't maybe uh, followed your work or weren't around in 2012 to see your keynote, maybe just a brief introduction to sort of your, your career path through um, uh, over the last 10 years and also the, the work you did before uh, and your time in the, the glam sector. Uh, sure. Um, uh, I am not a museum professional by training. Uh, I am not even a computer professional by training. If I studied anything, right. uh, it was painting. Um, and I mentioned that only because when I was in school was, was when the web first started bubbling up. Um, and it became, you know, I was part of that, that generation for whom everything sort of changed on a dime. Um, and it was that idea that, you know, maybe there was an avenue uh, to share your art beyond the gallery system or beyond the sort of norms that existed then. And that led me down the rabbit hole of the web and computers, because at, at one point I just decided I didn't want to be beholden to someone else to, to make these things possible. Um, so the, the abbreviated version is I worked at an ISP uh, on a tiny island, uh, and then eventually I worked at Flickr, uh, and then I was at a design studio for a while. And it was during those years that I used to, uh, I used to show up at museum conferences. Um, <laughs> and I would be the guy that would swoop in from 50,000 feet and wave my arms around and talk about the internet and then leave and say, I'll see you again in a year. I hope it all goes well. Um, and after I was at the design studio, I got a call from Seb Chan one day, uh, who was director of digital and emerging media at Cooper Hewitt. And he said, we're looking for someone uh, to do engineering in New York. Uh, do you know anyone? And I said, well, what about me? Because at that point I was starting to think maybe it was time to roll up my sleeves and, and actually pitch in. Um, so I went to Cooper Hewitt, uh, we did the pen. That was a big, terrifying and exciting project. Um, and then uh, my partner and I came back to the West Coast and I worked for uh, a mapping startup. So the, the thread has been maps and museums throughout. Um, the startup ran its course and I got in touch with the people here and I said, you know, I, I would like to run digital. You know, you have all of this amazing stuff and this huge collection um, and not enough people know about it. And what if? So here we are. That's amazing. I, I love the, whenever I talk to people that they, um, the idea of like I'm not a, a museum prof a professional, but movies, <laughs> the um, the paths that people have come in and the sort of the backgrounds, and I think that that part of what makes a, a fantastic museum professional is this um, yeah that sort of the, the varied uh, the history that you you've brought. I sorry, I know I I totally one hundred percent assumed you were like going to be a tech um, I don't know developer from day dot. Uh, so uh, yeah, no. <laughs> awesome. Um, so yeah, I think uh, looking back at the uh, first of all, I just want to point out you're one of the fantastic keynotes who have written down um, your your talk and provided your slides that are still available online. I will put the uh, the link in the chat um, because that made my life so much easier to be able to go and sort of read up on, on what you were doing and, and the thinking. Um, and in 2012, as you, sort of, you mentioned you were sort of talking around the you didn't mention the pen or the work that Cooper Hewitt was doing. I think you were still two years away from from launching that and you, you talked around the ideas of the, the building blocks you were, you were putting in place. Um, and I guess now looking back, seeing what you were talking about and seeing what you ended up with, you can, you can start seeing that thread that was leading um, to the pen. But going through the talk and apologies, I'm gonna pull up a quote you said 10 years ago and ask you about it. 
um, which is not, not mean at all, but um, I was reading through the talk and one of the lines that really struck me as I was, I was reading was, um, I'm just gonna read it off my screen, is uh, I happen to believe that what we do is a luxury afforded to us by our peers. We are afforded the responsibility of keeping safe our cultural heritage because all those other people who don't live inside the hula hoop think it's important. And I think that was one of the, um, uh, just one of those lines that kind of jumped out at me, particularly thinking about the the last two years, um, the the, you know, um, in light of the pandemic, uh, recession, um, the sort of uh, climate crisis. I wonder, reflecting on that sentence, do you still do you yeah do you think do you still believe that? Do you think that's changed? Do you, yeah, sorry to just put out a random, the one line from a one hour talk. <laughs> That's fine. I mean, the short answer is yes. Um, I think, I mean, I think if there, if you go through all the talks from the last 10 or 15 years, there are probably a few threads, but one of them is, there's two parts to it. One of them is that uh, no one understands what museum professionals are talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's, that's overstating it, but you know, the other one is that people may not have the language to talk about museums the way we do or collections or the, the mandate, but they still think they're important. You know, we still, even if museums went away tomorrow, we would rebuild something like them. We would rebuild something to uh, try and make sense of, honor, celebrate, you know, there's a lot of adjectives you can use, the past. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what I meant where, you know, as a community, we give uh, some people the charge to take care of this stuff. Um, and that's a great, you know, to, to be given that is a great privilege. I, I think you used uh, what I can't. I'm not going to uh, timekeepers. I think was the the line you used to describe museum professionals. And again, I, I love that as a as a thing. And I was just I was I guess I was reflecting on that over the past two years, where some of the the idea of um, of what a museum is and what we have to what we have to do. Thinking about you know the the, the pivot to to digital, and as you say, we we had to create new methods. We um, even if the museums are all shut down, uh, people still found ways for us to be able to um to be timekeepers and i think there's also sorry just one more line in there that I, again i really love which was around um uh or at least it's what you you get up every day and you try and make a good faith effort towards that goal and i just think you know i really like that set sentiment that's why many of us are in the um i guess we're in the profession to be able to walk to work to, uh, walk work towards that goal so again I'm reflecting on that now as i've mentioned that you are um you, you've already mentioned the pen. I was going to say, do we? <laughs> is that something we we, we talk about? We um, uh, and you sort of in the talk I mentioned you were you're talking about the building blocks. Um, instead of going, I'm assuming that most of the audience watching this will have heard about it and sort of known. I guess my question to you is going back to that 2012 talk to, to Aaron back then. Would you would you still do the the pen again? Would is it still a project that you have? You would would you do it differently? I guess if if you could go back to 2012, Aaron. Perhaps. Uh, I think um, from, a, from a practical perspective, we were, so for people who don't know, the, the, the basic model was we, there were two approaches. One is we could put all of the intelligence, all of the smarts, all of the computing in the labor rails. We could label rails, we could embed it in the building. And that would have made producing and giving out uh, a token uh, really cheap and really easy. And, and it, importantly, it would have allowed people to take those home and to be a souvenir. And that's the approach that Acme took with the lens. Yep. And we would have, except that the literally the building uh, argued against that approach. We couldn't do it because of uh, the architecture and and those constraints. So we were left with, you know, an extraordinarily difficult project. 
that got done in a ridiculously compressed time frame that was not cheap. Uh, it was definitely more than lunch money, but it was also a lot cheaper than other projects that were being done at the time. And, and that's not to call out the other projects, but to say the thing that the thing that always excited me about the pen was we managed to get it done and we managed to design, we managed to, to conceive and to develop and to manufacture bespoke hardware for the needs and purposes of a museum. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty exciting because what it said to me was, if we can do this, what can we do next? Mm -hmm. And so one example, you know, I talked about recently is, um, we always imagined that, you know, in five years or 10 years, whatever it was, that we might simply replace the circuit board that was in the pen to be able to add components that were cheap enough and, and had a low enough power draw that the pen could start to improve. So, you know, as it, when it launched, the pen could only record stuff. It couldn't transmit any data. So you had to physically tap it to a docking station or a table and the data would be transferred off and then up to, uh, up to our website. Um, and we're not quite there yet, but actually I think in 2022, you could get a circuit board with an embedded wireless chip. And that way, you know, a whole chunk of infrastructure in the museum can go away. And importantly, the user experience doesn't change. The pen is the same. Yeah. It just gets better. And that felt exciting. And it still does. Uh, and I know that a lot of people sort of think like what we did was uh, a ridiculous and expensive indulgence, mm. but um, I just, I disagree. Oh, we're still talking about it 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think, um, I mean, do you think that, uh, I guess there's been, um, and again, I think I'm maybe stealing one of your lines from your blogs, is it um, around um, don't touch the glass and bring your own, um, which is now we don't want people using touch screens because of COVID cleaning. Uh, and so encouraging people to bring their own device. And I guess in the 10 years since the pen, we're now seeing, you know, NFT readers on, um, on, on phones. And I guess is that is, would you, if you were to redo the, that project now, would you be looking at bringing own, your own device? Is that? that be the thinking realistically it, it it might be harder now to argue in favor of custom hardware mm -hmm. um which is a shame i think because you know if we managed to get this done 10 years ago just imagine what's possible now yeah. um, because the hardware has continued to improve and just get cheaper um what i think you know, what we could have done at the time we launched and what we, sh what we would have done now is we would have exposed the underlying API methods um, and we would have made a bigger deal about it. Um, the, the API methods that the pen used weren't public, mm -hmm. but had we made them public, anyone in 2012 could have written an Android application. Um, you know, I think recently at, at the museum, we had to transition an interactive from being touch-based to uh, controlling it with your phone. Mm. Um, and it works and it's, you know, it's on the floor and people use it. And uh, from a technical perspective, it's been a, an interesting challenge to work out those mechanics. Um, but practically from an interaction perspective, I still think the touch-based version is better. Um, I think it's more inviting yeah, uh, I don't really think people want to get their phones out that often. That's it. Well, I think that you yeah. know that was one of the things about the pen was the first time you used the pen, it was exciting and you look at it and you wave it around. The goal was for the second time for the pen to just vanish, and you could just reach out and and keep talking to someone, and like the the touching activity would be That's invisible. It. Yeah. I definitely spend way too much time on my phone. So any <laughs> any opportunity to not get it out is um and to and, and particularly thinking of like my kids and stuff, like how to and I say the, the tactile um yeah. The, yeah. 
I was just gonna just to repeat myself. I think I think that is the the value and the benefit of being able both technologically and financially to develop bespoke hardware no that's um yeah no i, I agree and i think you like you said that the um i mean yeah the, the pen is, is a fantastic example of where you can see that investment see how it's now been continued to be used and i love the idea of seeing uh like the, the acme example is like the next phase and, and hopefully we'll see continue to see developments on on that theme um i guess thinking back to so your your I, I love the idea of reflecting back. And so going to the, the 2012 um, uh, keynote, um, before you step on stage, if you were, uh, the, the time traveling was the, the next big thing, what were any warnings you'd be giving yourself about either that keynote or the next 10 years coming up? Anything, I mean, pandemic aside, is there anything else you would, um, I guess, warn, warn past Aaron around? Uh, well, the first thing I will say is that it was a. I, I'm I'm grateful for have being given that opportunity to do that keynote, um, and uh, you know, particularly because it was, it did sort of go down a few rabbit holes, uh, quite a few, um, and that was, you know, thank you for that. Thank you for for listening. <laughs> um, yeah, I maybe not so much the. I mean, the warnings I would have given myself, not so much for the keynote, but for, you know, the sector and for quote unquote digital um, is, I haven't really found a charitable way to say this. I mean, it's a bit blunt, but, you know, I think museums, a lot of people in museums are comfortable with and used to uh, winning wars of attrition, right? W museums typically operate at a scale, you know, where everything happens in years, mm -hmm. sometimes decades. And so the idea of outlasting a five-year technology project, if you don't like it, is nothing. <laughs> right, uh, yeah. And, and that's, that's an interesting dynamic because you know, people who are interested in technology, part of the reason they're interested is that it allows things to happen so much faster than before. Yeah. Um, so that's just something I've been aware of. And I think, you know, I, I have spoken in the past about this idea of designing systems for patients, uh, not patients, but the act of being patient. Yeah. Um, with that idea that, not everyone, including staff, uh, comes around to an idea as quickly as you do. Yes. And there's lots of reasons. People have busy lives. Um, and we need to think about the, the technologies that we build by and for the sector to be able to outlast people's reluctance. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, that means... You know, one, it, it means that things can't take 18 months to develop, that you need to be able to launch something quickly to prove or disprove an idea. Mm -hmm. But importantly, it needs to be able to run by itself and it needs to be financially viable to run by itself so that, you know, you start to develop this practice of showing to people that, that scratching an inch or an itch or, or working through a hunch isn't going to break the bank, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, and it isn't going to place an enormous demand on their time and resources. And, and importantly, that something can be done. And, you know, again, that it can be improved. Um, I could keep going, but I, if you want no, to. I think, I, no, I think there. that's a really, um, i just reflecting on uh, uh, 2012 was also, I think, my, the first time I, I found out about NDF and just thinking, so the, the ten, reflecting on my 10 years of kind of um, in, the, in this space, I think that's a really, um, yeah, really valid point around. Uh, but what I think I have seen change is that people are becoming more, like you say, the more you show, the more people get on board and the more um, those 
uh, sections of the business that may be resistant or you say willing to wait out um, a project uh, are becoming more and more invested and I can guess that's the yeah we're seeing that change and um, it'll be interesting to see I guess as new new um, new professionals come into the organization again how that that trajectory is going to change going forwards um, yeah it's a it's an interesting reflection I, I'm yeah really um, yeah well I will uh, <laughs> I will um, thinking of your most recent uh, position so and again loving the, the title uh, head of internet typing which I'm you, you mentioned I think you just made up which I love again yes. um, <laughs> the, um, in an airport a museum in an airport uh, fantastic idea I think as you know captive audience lots of seating and an opportunity to tell stories for people who have um, time uh, how it's a really stupid question how does is it a museum in is it in the arrivals like well where, how does it work how does a museum in an airport work uh so we are uh we are a fully accredited museum um uh and we are basically everywhere at the airport um it it gets very confusing we internally we we split a lot of hairs and i spent a lot of time trying to explain to people that no one outside of our immediate office <laughs> understands or cares about any of these things. Yeah. Um, but briefly, there are uh, 26 galleries throughout the airport. Mm -hmm. um, there are 100 to 200 public artworks, which are actually administered by the San Francisco Arts Commission, but because they're on site, we take care of them. Um, there is an aviation, uh, this is where it gets confusing. It's the Aviation Museum and Library which is uh, an actual archive and library for paper documents that is a faithful reproduction of the 1939 terminal okay. that's next to one of the international departure gates. Um, but that's just one set of the galleries that we have throughout the airport. And on top of that, there is a permanent collection of 150,000 aviation related objects. Oh. Um, so in effect, the airport is the museum. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, uh, it's, again, a mind boggling um, kind of uh, idea. And, and so uh, your role in the, uh, the creating exhibitions within this, what's, you know, what's your, um, what's your? No, so I'm not, uh, I'm not curatorial. Uh, my role has been to figure out how to take all of these things that we do um, and some of it is just the 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 legwork of getting them online you know yeah. for example one of the reasons that I wanted to come and work here is that we do everything internally from registration curatorial exhibition design photography graphic design installation it's all done in-house which is not the norm mm. Uh, and it's kind of exciting. And so I thought, then one thing they didn't do was digital. And we have all of this stuff and no one knows about it. And this is why we made the internet. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, so the, so the goal has been just some sort of mechanical stuff about getting more and more of the collection online, uh, but then also imagining how we build systems so that you know, the, the museum might follow you onto the airplane. Nice. Um, and I spent a long time thinking about and, and building systems to basically make place or location the, the joint or double joint mm -hmm. around which everything pivots because everyone is coming from somewhere. <laughs> everyone is going to some place. Nice. Um, and fundamentally, there's no part of coming to the airport, the, the airline you're flying with, the place you're going to, the gate you're standing at, that uh, shouldn't have a straight line back to the collection. Hmm. I mean, that's, um, yeah, I love that, yeah. That's, I was gonna say, because um, I was ref reflecting on, um, I had a quick look, look through uh, some of the work you've been doing and thinking, um, I was reflecting on collection, like generally collections online and sort of thinking that um, 
the since 2012 i mean the, the work i think you did at cooper hewitt to kind of change and you said there uh could be a color was a, a, it was the first time we i think the first time we sort of saw big like color searches and um as an entry point into the collections and i think you know yeah uh, an airport place and um yeah is, is a fantastic way to enter and to explore and to give people a, a connection do do you think i mean collections online generally they've they've kind of still looking the the same uh and we've we've had some maybe novel ways in do you think um i said do you think there's new ways of accessing that we could are you are investigating any new ways of exploring collections i think you know uh, place and uh, people place purpose are really nice examples of that um and do you think what do you think the future for i guess collections online could look like because Again, I mean, they, they kind of still look the same as they did when we first put them online, right? They do. Um, uh, and I think that's been one of the challenges uh, with, you know, the, the rest of museum staff is what I used to say to people, and I still say to people, is once you put once you give an object a stable permanent home on the internet, and when I say object, what I really mean is a first class actor, which is anything in your collection, a yeah. place, a constituent, a role, it, it doesn't matter. The things that you think are important, you give those stable, reliable, permanent homes on the internet. And the, the great thing is, is that you have the infinite space to the right of that identifier to do everything you want mm. and and we haven't but we still can and so one of the things that i started thinking about i think especially after we launched the pen at cooper hewitt was what does it mean to start to put the curatorial file for an object online mm. so maybe not everything right there are some things you don't want in there but yeah. But there's all this other research material that curators have that, that go into the, the selection of an object yeah. that is fascinating. Um, so, you know, I keep coming back to just stable, like a, a network of documents on the web, yeah. in large part because the web is no longer cool. And you know, everyone's shifting their attention to all of these other systems, which technologically are, are a marvel, but they don't, you know, they come with a lot of very serious risks. Mm -hmm. None of them have the, the motivations and the politics of the web, which was to be a free, open, and unlicensed system. And so, um, sorry, my computer is good up dialogues um and i think that's what made the web important for the cultural heritage sector was that it was you know it was a, a, a technological system that was open and whose barriers were low enough that everyone could participate so you know i i think when we look at augmented reality and all the rest of it it's important to remember that there are literally only a handful of companies with the resources and the financial capital to actually run those things and, and that is the definition of a walled garden the i think i mean uh, yeah the maybe we are still 10 years after after that we're still it's still building block stuff right we still like you say we need to be putting uh, persistent identifiers we need to be um uh, yeah, and not getting caught up in some shiny tech, but actually getting the data that we have available in a in a way that is addressable and uh, connectable. Um, and so, I guess on that, reflecting, um, we still got lots of work to do, and, and we're, you know, in ten years, we've we've made some jumps. If I was, if we were going to catch up again, we'll get you. We, we'll try and talk again before ten years. But if I was going to come back again in uh, in ten years, what do you think? Um, any big big changes for the sector? Do you think any thinking of technology, thinking of the growing, um, you know, these walled gardens of, of corporations that are taking data and um, and I guess providing services and platforms? 
any I don't know predictions. The one why why you think the one random thing I I, I do I I have a crystal ball um uh, just randomly I have on my desk, but you can borrow it. Uh, as far as the technology goes, um, well, I, I mean, this is, this is a little bit pessimistic, but unless we actually start soon to, uh, to tackle the staffing and retention problem, um, we'll be in the same position. Or, or that we are now, which is we will have collections. Um, we will still be appreciated but undervalued for our role in, uh, in taking care of them. Mm -hmm. um, we will uh, not have, we will, we will have very little, uh, long-term experience when it comes to technology um, and we will continue to raise a lot of capital funds on shiny projects that won't last that would be better put towards you know operations or staffing and so i guess we have an audience here of the, the ndf community what would be to, to, to help prevent that. So that's what a, a future we could end up towards. Is it around us building internal capacity, is training more, more people in the understanding of digital and technology? I'm just sort of- Yeah. Yeah, is that- Fundamentally, I think we need, and I, I don't pretend to have all the, the answers. It's, I don't have a, you know, five point solution for yeah. everyone, but I think we need to think about a way uh, to, I think, one thing that would be useful is for people to understand that you may come in and out of the cultural heritage sector. That is actually a thing that, that doesn't happen. And when it does, people are suspicious of you when you come back. <laughs> they're bitter when you leave and then they're like, why are you back? And then, you know, I think we need to get to a point where at least for in, with technology, maybe for all roles, mm. it's, it's both okay and helpful to transition in and out. Yeah. Um, and we need to think about how we we need to think about we need to think about how we keep people <laughs> but that's that's easy to say yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think we need to start training people internally and that in the short term that might fall on the larger institutions to because they will have the capacity and the resources to train people. Um, and, you know, I've imagined sometimes, I, I would like the Smithsonian to do this. I'll just say it. Yeah. Um, and when I think about the Smithsonian doing it, I think about saying to people, you know, who are, who are green, you know, some of you will come here and you will learn your chops and you will understand that the private sector pays you and you'll just leave. Mm. That's okay. Um, some of you are lifers. That's great. Uh, some of you will yeah. uh, will stay for a little while, go to the private sector, and then we want you to come back. We want you to bring that experience. And and what we what I would like to see happen is, you know, those junior people who are working at, say, the Smithsonian, then go on to become the senior people at a smaller institution with fewer resources. And it is in that way that we will start to you know, build a, a pool of people that uh, that will help sustain our efforts. I, th I think you've, you've uh, yeah, that really touched on something that we're thinking about within with NDF um, around building capability within within the sector. I think it's a, a real a, a challenge for us as a community to, to really take take away from this talk and to, to think about what we can do. I love the idea and that, that suspicion of when people leave and come back. I think that's 100% true. <laughs> Um, but again, thinking about that, the, the life cycle, or the, the yeah, the, the life cycle of start, that's not going to be the right word, but the, the pattern of people moving in and out and the transferable skills and yeah. how do we encourage that? How do we encourage people to, to, to move between organizations as well, to 
um, maybe on that short term secondments, internships, I don't, yeah, to, to build up capacity. Also, yeah, are, I think, sorry. Are they, oh, I was just going to say quickly, it's important to recognize that the cultural heritage sector will never have engineering or software teams of 400. Yeah. But it's pretty amazing what you can get done with a team of, you know, three to five people. I think um, in one of your talks or blogs, I read it was uh, stop comparing ourselves to Disney and Google because we're not going to have the yeah. resources. Thank you so much for spending uh, some time out of your day with us today. Um, I really look for I really enjoyed our chat and really enjoyed sort of, um, yeah just hearing hearing what's changed and thinking about what you're up to. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your day and um, yeah, thank you again. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.